Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back from your break. I'm not going to waste time with introductions. Let's dive straight into this. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a provocation. Uh, the cyber attack on Sony in 2012 was a hugely embarrassing event for the company. Angelina Jolie described as a spoiled brat. Its profit loss terms, however, didn't matter that much. Cost Sony Pictures a division with about $77 billion in sales and cost them about $41 million. And a big chunk of that was recovered in insurance a year later. So, Ms. Al, why should companies care about cyber security? I believe their prosperity is uh, dependent on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, Sony, the Sony case, uh, $41 million uh, from the direct cost. You have to look at the ripple effect um, be behind the slides or beside the site. But, you know, if, if you take a financial institution uh, going through a similar uh, disruption that Sony went through, um, you know, to be out of business, you could get in front of the bank. Uh, if you look at uh, critical infrastructure going through uh, a similar uh, situation that Sony went in, it could be a disaster. And so, uh, yeah, Sony is still its feet, um, although uh, that was a big breach, but uh, the implications are far uh, more serious than $41 million. Alain Nadal just spoke about the threat of uh, financial terrorism. What's the scale of the challenge facing the banks now? It's the same in any other industry, by the way. Be it as as a way to the national control. Is the the decision being what my my boss and CEO said is that they they still uh it is not just before the Bangladesh case and 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 the time after. So I work with you some uh some movies like uh of bigger uh data about the robbing the central bank when the Fed uh, at the time for the uh, Iran Free. In those cases, he was about taking a huge gap. You see it in this way, you see it in the And you also have to be able to fight the consequences that the implementation of the Fed has to be possible. You say that. Bangladesh case uh, reports uh, attacks on banks in Vietnam. Uh, would you say that Asia is a weak link when it comes to cyber security? I'm sorry, you're, you're uh, in the middle of a technical, uh, technical fix. Um, uh, Jonathan, let me, let me come to you for a moment. Um, Singapore is famously uh, trying to cut uh, internet connections to public servants' computers, uh, an air gapping way of um, dealing with the cyber crime threat. Does it make sense, do you think, to reduce the, the size of the target in this way? Um, I think I'd, I'd, I'd first like to start to make some uh, clarifications uh, about the claim for government policy. First of all, I think uh, the Singapore government, like every government in the world, um, does and should take cybersecurity very seriously. Uh, the threats facing governments are a bit different, perhaps from those facing commercial entities like the banks. Uh, in, in this case, it's not so much about stealing the money, because you know it's not where the money is. Um, because there is the companies that need your money. Um, it is about uh, you know stealing information, perhaps uh, bringing systems to a halt. It is about disruption, and it's about defacement, and it's about reputational damage. Um, every government uh, should, and many do, um, have to uh, take cybersecurity seriously in the sense that they're putting a, a lot of protections in place um, for their workers uh, to continue to um, do things on the same device and the surf the net, um, to do everything they want in their private lives as well. Uh, as well as their work lives. My point here is that the Singapore government is not supporting the government of the United States. It's not supporting the United States. It's not supporting the It's in fact something far more mundane. It's something that a lot of the companies here, and many companies I know, have already done. It's in banks and in central banks uh, and in security agencies throughout the world. And that is to ensure that public servants um, surf the internet on a different device uh, from the one that they use to access the internal networks or the intranet. 
Um, it's not uncommon to have different devices for an intranet uh, as well as an internet system. So just that's the, that's the only difference. Public servants will continue to have full access to the internet and you know, public facing e-services will continue exactly as they have uh, without any loss uh, in service or productivity. What I think is important here to note is that the air gapping, however, does confer um, a lot more um, security benefits uh, than were it not to have taken place. Um, the government in Singapore is building a smart nation and we've been touted for a long time as being a very digitally enabled government where a lot of services are online, they are digitized, we are a digital government. Uh, that means that, that we do have a lot of data, and it's data of citizens and it's data of companies, and this data needs to be protected. So I think we do have a public duty uh, to our people and our businesses to, to ensure that the kind of data <coughs> we collect is not the subject um, of an embarrassing hack. So, Jack, just to spell out what you, what you said there, are you talking about two parallel systems, an intranet and, and a public-facing uh, internet? And if that's the case, how will you transfer data from one side of that system to the other or from one of those systems to the other? I think one of the simplest ways is via email. So the public servants will continue to, continue to be able to email the public um, and uh, to email and work with each other on collaborative platforms. But uh, if, if they... The only thing that they will do on a different device, actually, is to surf the web. Now, um, I often ask public servants and other people, you know, where they most often surf the web uh, these days. And I ask them, is it on your office computer? Uh, or is it on your own tablet? Or is it a personal tablet? Or is it a handphone? So I ask you the same question. Where do you most often surf the internet uh, for, you know, websites and applications? And almost every single time, everyone will tell me the same thing, which is, actually, I surf the internet on my phone. I surf it on my tablet. Um, I actually don't do that much uh, on my office computer. Great. Nadal, do you see any downsides to this approach? Actually, I do. Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I understand the challenge, uh, and I respect uh, um, the uh, responsibility that the government has to protect uh, uh, national interests uh, you know, their citizens' information and so on and so forth. However, I believe that air gapping the system um, has two caveats. Uh, one is obvious. Um, I do believe that there will be uh, a drop in productivity. Um, it might be intangible uh, in the beginning. Uh, it might be uh, difficult to measure it. Um, but when you think about um, millennials, um, that are used to having one device that they can use anytime, anywhere, for everything. Um, if they have to enter an environment where there are two different networks, um, this will have a cost. Um, and, and so that's the first thing. It's about productivity. Secondly, I believe that at the end of the day, um, two separate networks have, uh, have obvious advantages in terms of security. However, um, it is going to be very difficult um, to uh, deploy and to co consistently um, remain with two separate networks. Because at the end of the day, um, data will have to move between these networks. Uh, most of the information is going to be on the internet. Uh, workers, um, for good reason, are going to want to take the information in and out. Uh, very uh, quickly, you'll get devices where you sanitize the data in order to do this back and forth. Um, and I project um, humbly that uh, three to four years later, these two networks uh, will become one. Uh, and so I believe um, as the trajectory of the world is to become more and more interconnected, we're just going to have to find more sophisticated um, methods of protecting uh, networks rather than separating them. Thank you. Aditya, I'd like to bring you in on this question. Um, there was a case early this year of a hospital in Los Angeles that found its computer locked down by a virus. Uh, and they went back to a low-tech um, option. They, they started sending each other faxes and uh, taking patients' records down on paper charts. So, so is there an Amish option for dealing with cybersecurity? Can you, can you just switch off the internet and be safer that way? Okay, before I answer your question, let me respond to what uh, was said just now regarding the Singapore thing. Then I'll come back to your question. So, 
Uh, whenever I leave my apartment, especially when my wife is with me, she tells me, please lock the door. Okay. So I lock the door. But I know very well that if somebody really wants to get into my house or my apartment, they can. They can actually break the lock and get in. So why do I lock the door? Why do we do that? We do that to make it difficult for the malicious actor to enter the house. And that is what is air gapping all about. So air gapping does not mean that you cannot get into the system. Stuxnet is a fine example where it was 100% air gap, beautiful in the mountains, but still the great guys got in there through a very uh, interesting way of uh, doing things. So I think the, the, the approach that Singapore government is using right now is a decent approach. It's a first step where you, you do things which will make it difficult for malicious actors to get it. That does not mean that your productivity may or may not go down. I have to spend a few moments to open the lock in my house. Does it mean my productivity goes down? Probably yes. But that's what happens uh, when you do these kinds of things. So let, then let me come back to your question. So uh, I think we don't have a choice regarding using internet. That choice doesn't exist. We have to use the internet. So you cannot, if a hospital or a bank or any uh, organization gets hacked and their records stolen and all kinds of uh, bad things happen, that does not mean that you will stop using technology. Technology is there and we are all kind of wedded to certain technologies. And internet is one of those technologies to which we are wedded and it's not going to go away. I cannot imagine it going away in any way. So we have to do things to make the use of this technology safe and secure. Now, Doc, what do you think about switching off the internet? I mean, there was a case I came across, another case I came across of the, I think the Russian security service uh, placing an order for typewriters, which everyone took an indication that they weren't sending emails anymore. Um, <laughs> is that, I mean, is, that, is, that, is this a viable approach? Look, I, I believe that uh, um, the internet is not technology. It's obviously based on technology. But the internet um, is a way of life. Uh, and and it, it has changed and will change everything that we're used to. Um, it revolutionized information, and it, now it will revolutionize everything, uh, from transportation to health, energy. Uh, the interconnectedness has tremendous opportunities um, in any aspect of life that we can imagine. Uh, and like any other um, change or trajectory, uh, there's perils there as well. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, you can live without the internet anymore, or you can, but productivity will drop immensely. And, and you know, speaking about metaphors, I would say that trying to create true infrastructures would be like try not, you know, the, the, the locking the door is one metaphor. Another metaphor is let's build another transportation system altogether. Um, so adjacent to the road that we're driving on right now, we'll have a safe road where accidents are less prone to happen. I said, let's take the roads that we're using right now and just make it safer. We'll come on to roads in a minute, but, but first back to banks, um, Alain. Um, there have been a couple of, uh, uh, of hacking cases, high-profile hacking cases in Asia. I mean, is, is Asia a sort of weak link when it comes to cybersecurity? Do you, do you think this is a part of the world that is um, less able to deal with the threat than, than Europe or the US? No, no, I, I don't think so. I think, yes, you mentioned some uh, case, Bangladesh was one. Uh, there may be others ev eventually, but I think it's much more global than we think. Uh, it's, uh, it's a global threat that is all, some way also connected to the, the fact that, you know, internet, uh, telecommunication are vastly expanding. Uh, they're increasing very much. I mean, everyone wants to provide, uh, you know, services through, through that channel. And, 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 you know, the bad guys, I mean, uh, are trying to use or abusing actually these, these channels actually to get to what they want. But I'm just building also to what has been said as well. I mean, looking at uh, uh, paraphrasing on, on, the, on the locking the door uh, stuff is that it, I don't think you can have a single solution for that problem. I think it's a combination of different solutions that ultimately will make the life of those bad guys much harder. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the game will always be about making, that, making sure that that combination of solution we have stay ahead of the behaviors that the bad guys have. It's also one thing that's quite important is that I think in the past it used to be the case where the bad guys were only um, sort of guys that were abusing technology only. They were actually 
they, they, they were excellent in hacking, cracking the technology in order to get access to something. Yeah. What we see nowadays is, is about it's becoming much more sophisticated because not only they're doing this, they, they're really smart in, in hacking technology, they're moving very fast, but also they become very, very much uh, very, very smart in understanding the different processes that they're trying to hack. Right? When it comes to banking, banking is not an easy stuff, right? especially when it comes to transferring funds from one bank to another one or from one individual to another one. Actually, it's quite a cumbersome, quite a, quite a sophisticated process. That's where they're good, becoming good as well. So they, they're good at hacking technology, and they're good actually in understanding how to actually abusing the processes that we have. So the, that's what I'm saying, actually. The, the, the right solution is not only about you know, you know, technology and all that. It is, it is, clearly. We're doing that as a community, as an industry. It's also I'm making sure that the processes we have behind, which are more financial processes, okay, are much more robust than they used to be. So this isn't just a question of uh, cyber criminals trying to extract information, but, but actually trying to control processes as well? Is that, have I well, they, that they're trying to understand the processes so that actually they can actually... It's, it's, at the end of the day, when it comes to banking, it's all about money. It's, it's right. really about actually having access to the money and eventually yeah. robbing the money. But, but they, they're trying to understand the processes that you have behind so that actually they can access the money. Tracking, what do you think that banks can do to protect themselves better and, and also to reduce their costs in this area? I mean, do you think they need to be cooperating more when it comes to cybersecurity? I think there's a lot to be said about cybersecurity cooperation across the board, not just with the banks, but all the critical information uh, info comms, uh, information sectors. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why in Singapore the cybersecurity agency was set up uh, to provide a single point uh, for a lot of the intelligence, threat intelligence, uh, incident reports that take place across different sectors because, uh, frankly, hackers love the fact that none of their victims want to, to, to talk to each other. They love the fact that none of the banks want to reveal that they've been hacked and so that they, because, you know, that would cause a crisis of confidence in their client community um, and therefore, you know, won't tell anyone. Uh, and therefore, they can continue on the same exploit, or, or agency after agency, organization after organization. But I think that is beginning to change. I think the level of information sharing, um, even the use of similar um, uh, you know, you know, reports, uh, similar SOCs, uh, is beginning to have an impact. I think the sharing of information is going to be one of the critical things that we have to combat, um, I think, what is a very diffuse and shady uh, uh, adversary out there. But there's a good reason not to share information, isn't there? I mean, once target, once we knew the target had been hacked, their share price went down significantly. So, what? I mean, how do you how do you incentivize companies to, to share information? I think one of the the main points to note is that if you share information early, um, your share price might go down. But if you share information much much later and involves the accounts of your clients, uh, and you did not tell them about it and you did not tell them how uh, badly they were affected. And by the way, this was the case in a number of hacking incidents uh, involving things like the Office of Personnel Management in the U.S. Um, this will have an even more uh, bad implication on the reputation of that organization in terms of transparency, disclosure. So there's always that quandary about you know, sharing early, not really knowing you know, how bad things were, um, and, and you know, possibly affecting your share price versus sharing much later and having everyone uh, think that uh, you're, not a, you're not the kind of organization that is to be trusted. Aditya, what's your view of this? Is there an advantage to being transparent? Absolutely. I think uh, what happens is if uh, an organization is uh, hacked or attacked uh, and they found, uh, find it out at a later time, if they share that information with other organizations, similar organizations, it will help the others in protecting themselves better. So if I'm a bank and somebody tells me, hey, this is, I was hacked, and this is how I was hacked. If they tell me, then I will immediately go and find out in my IT department, well, this is how they were hacked. Are we secure from that kind of malicious uh, virus or no malware or whatever? And then I will immediately <coughs> initiate a process within my bank or my organization to improve my own security measures. So. Transparency helps. Now, the other bank may say, hey, we don't care about the others, uh, but the point is that everyone benefits through this transparency. And I'm not saying you reveal your internal banking secrets. No, you're just revealing uh, a potential or a weakness that was exploited in your uh, 
management of the infrastructure and the creation of the infrastructure that uh, we are using for uh, various services. Thank you, Adija. I'm going to open this up for questions um, in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So do please, if there are things that you want to uh, contribute or ask the panel, uh, do please be ready. I will, I will come and pick on you. Um, Adija, another question for you. An executive of the, uh, the US uh, NSA uh, speaking this year about industrial control systems. He said the security of industrial control systems is something that keeps them awake, awake at night. Um, is it something that should keep us all awake at night? Absolutely. So the... Uh, Probably some of you know there's an organization called ICS CERT in the United States, and they keep track of the incidents, uh, which are attacks, uh, successful or unsuccessful, on critical infrastructure in the United States. And critical infrastructure is defined essentially as an infrastructure that uh, enables the public of the country or city to go about doing their work uh, in a timely manner, an efficient manner. So for example, critical manufacturing, uh, power, water, uh, transportation, these all fall under critical infrastructure. Now, last year alone, to 2015, there were uh, uh, more than 250 incidents of attempts at critical infrastructure, infrastructure in the United States. We don't have these numbers for other countries in the world. We don't have who in the world, which power uh, grid, or which transportation system in the world is currently under surveillance by malicious actors. We don't know that information. We don't have that information. However, we do know quite a few su successful hacks, successful attacks, cyber attacks on industrial control systems. And I'll just give you one example. The most recent one was in 2015, December, when uh, one of the uh, power grids in Ukraine was attacked, and about 80,000 people in that city and neighborhood lost power for several hours. Now, of course, we don't want our money to be washed out from a bank. So certainly banks are extremely important for our day-to-day -day life, uh, and one can imagine them to be critical infrastructure in some sense. But here, when power is not there, critical services like hospitals, you know, emergency uh, services in the, in the city or in the country, they, are, they could be affected if the power goes out for a long time, despite the emergency uh, batteries and so on. So power, water, uh, then transportation, these are all extremely important uh, critical infrastructure that ought to be protected from potential attacks. And there have been at least uh, a dozen or so attacks that have been successful in the past uh, since about 2010. And I have lots of examples of those, but I won't share them right now. Thank you, Adija. Jacqueline, this is um, scary stuff, isn't it? Singapore is pushing pretty deep into the Internet of Things. Right? This uh, city is the location of uh, the first uh, driverless taxi trial in the world. Um, what safeguards are there for the public? Um, it is something that keeps us awake at night, I will say. Um, there are 11 critical uh, sectors in Singapore, and all of them uh, have to have their cybersecurity plans in place, um, and these are vetted uh, by the government uh, to ensure that they are taking it seriously. Now, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the vulnerabilities um, uh, come from the fact that um, in the SCADA systems, uh, there's an assumption that they are uh, not going to be bridged. So even the SCADA systems need that kind of discipline, and it's the same discipline that we are putting in place for the rest of government in terms of our enterprise IT systems uh, to ensure that they're not bridged. So very often it's either uh, someone who is an insider uh, or someone who uh, has bridged uh, the system and bridged it to the internet. Uh, so these are, these are things that we, we, we have to keep an eye on uh, going forward. The internet of things and cybersecurity poses a whole new set of challenges, uh, which I have to say, um, I don't think that the cyber industry or the internet of things industry has fully gotten its head around. There is no current um, prevailing doctrine uh, on cybersecurity for um, the Internet of Things, which is why we're having a conference uh, next month on Smart Nation and IoT security. Um, it can't be the, the existing, uh, the prevailing wisdom on, on how we manage uh, enterprise IT systems, uh, which is, you know, let's patch it, uh, let's fix the incidents a certain way, because these, a lot of these are sensors. Um, they're out there in the field, they're outdoors, um, they're, not, uh, they're not servers in data centers. Um, they are not endpoints in offices, um, and when and they're so cheap, 
So by the time, you know, the amount of time it takes to patch it is the same amount of time it takes to take it down, crush it under your feet, and uh, get a new one up there. Um, so these are things that we need to start thinking through. And autonomous vehicles, B2I, B2B uh, infrastructure, and the communications is another big area that we need to look at to ensure that um, cybersecurity, um, hack proofness uh, is in place. So it's a big, big endeavor uh, to relook the way that from the IT world and the OT world, what does that mean in the IoT world for cybersecurity? And the answers are not fully there yet, but I expect them to be something that is uh, developed over the next one to two years. Thank you. Nadal, can I bring you in on this? Should I worry about my driverless taxi being hacked? And do we need parallel safe taxis driven by humans? I heard so. I think, I think the question is, uh, uh, what's more dangerous? You have, to take a balanced, uh, you have to take a balanced approach to this. I think sometime in the not so, uh, uh, sometime in the near future or in the not so far future, uh, people are going to look back to 2016 and they won't believe the fact that uh, after this is over, we're going to get into uh, manned uh, cars um, and put our lives in the hands of people we've never heard of or we don't even know at all because they're just taxi drivers which, who we don't know anything about. Um, obviously, every Tesla self-driven <coughs> car that's going to have a malfunction or uh, anything like that will we'll, we'll get a lot more uh, um, press than uh, um, the fact that we have uh, tens of thousands of people dying in, in car accidents every year. We've just gotten used to it. Um, but the fact that we have manned cars um, driving one in front of the other 100 kilometers per hour where all you need is somebody to just a blink of the eye uh, and a small turn. So looking into the future, I think, yes, we will have unmanned cars as the uh, normal. Um, they'll be much safer than what we have today. Having said that, yes, we do need to find a way to protect the cybersecurity aspect of it, but it's possible. I think when you look at... Uh, um, the SCADA systems and the PLC systems, the biggest uh, malfunctions that we're going to see, I think, are not going to be about hackers. They're going to be about uh, human error. Mm -hmm. um, the systems were designed to be isolated. These systems were designed to work with other machines. As they're interconnecting to the IT system, uh, which are man-machine and not machine-machine, what we're going to see is many more mistakes that are going to meet, lead to many more malfunctions. And so the first thing that we need to do with our critical infrastructure is get visibility like we have in the IT systems so we can track it, so we can see anomalies, so we can alert to anomalies. And honestly, most of these anomalies are not going to be by terrorist or, or nation-supported uh, uh, hacks, but rather human errors that are going to become more prevalent. Let me give you just one example. Uh, in the IT world, uh, we're used to getting pings from all over the place, and our systems know how to react to it. And they also, they're resilient enough to understand that there will be mistakes. In the OT world, or in the critical infrastructure, one ping at the wrong time to the wrong machine can take it down. That's what's going to need to improve dramatically so that we can benefit from um, the opportunities that we have with the interconnectedness of, again, transportation, medical, and so on. And is there some critical infrastructure that just needs to be detached from the internet? I mean, that's traditionally been the case with nuclear power stations, hasn't it? I believe that, uh, um, you know, air, real air gap systems either don't exist, and if they do, we shouldn't care about them. Um, the trajectory, is <coughs> the connectivity of everything and everyone all the time. And I don't think we should stop that. I think the opportunities there, let me give you an example again. Imagine our medical uh, treatment uh, 20 years from now, when all our DNA is sequenced and connected, and we're, we're, we're going to start to get medicated um, based on our own gene sequence uh, and who we are, rather than some kind of best practices. That is going to happen. That is going to improve everything dramatically. Think about the amount of cars we're going to have in the world. So, 99% of the time, our cars are idle. That doesn't make sense. So we're wasting money, we're wasting energy, we're wasting resources. And so the interconnectivity and computer power coupled with artificial intelligence is going to bring all that to a whole new space. The flip side of that is that, yes, there are 
challenges in cybersecurity. But these challenges are challenges that we can deal with. Um, Alain, it's been nearly 10 years uh, since the TJX data breach, which at the time was the, um, the biggest breach of uh, customer data on record. Do you think that since then companies have got better at detecting uh, and preventing data breaches? I think they are. They, they, they're certainly aware of, um, uh, of, of the increasing threat that they're, they're facing. At the same time, the, the whole challenge, as I said before, is, is to keep, uh, to, keep uh, to stay up to date and certainly ahead of, uh, of, of the threat that the guys are facing. And, and I think uh, in our company, we look at this actually, we, we, was, we try to summarize this in three words. The first is actually curiosity, is really to making sure that everyone, building on what we're talking about, about exchange of information, we clearly see that to still today, despite the threats, companies, people are just afraid to exposing the fact that they've been, they've been eventually hacked, uh, even in a, in a very anonymous way, and they, they're just afraid to, for visibility, visibility reason, uh, reputation reason, they're just afraid to expose this. So clearly, curiosity from everyone, companies, to, you know, to understanding what is happening and how you need to adapt, okay, is very much important. The second one is, is ownership. Wherever actually there are progress, wherever these, uh, these new processes and new methodologies, wherever actually there's new technologies, we need to make sure that we implement. I mean, building on the, on the, car, uh, the car topics we were discussing, if, if technology permits, right, let, let's use that, right? But let's use that in a way that, 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 people, uh, in, that people understand what to do and how to do, right? And then finally, challenge is clearly how can we learn from each and every other case we have in order to be better in future, right? I mean, how can we learn from the cyber attacks we've been exposed to in order to actually correct the weaknesses we have and, and actually build a, an additional protection on the top of what we, of what we had uh, before. So curiosity, ownership, challenge, for us is actually the, the, the way forward. And I think this is pretty much applicable in all industries that we have in the world. And just focusing on the industry that you're familiar with, uh, banks have a lot of costs and challenges these days, don't they? Where do you think cybersecurity comes in terms of, in terms of the I think, uh, I, uh, in my mind, it, uh, it must be, I, mean, I, I know many CEOs of, uh, of, of financial institutions here in Singapore and many other places in the world as well, that is clearly on the top of the agenda. Let me tell you that these are topics being discussed at the board level, at the executive committee levels. I know that there are many discussions between governments and, and, and CEOs, boards and all that because I appreciate that so when it comes, you know, the power is perhaps somewhere more important because actually, yes, if you, if you shut off actually the, the power grid of a given country, you don't have access to hospitals eventually, all this kind of stuff, right? At the same time, you know, in money, making sure that the, the money can keep flowing into the, in between banks, uh, through individuals and all that is, is rather important as well for the survival of the industry, for the survival of the economy as well. So let me tell you that it's actually very hard on the agenda of, uh, of many people in this world, governments and all that. So we are actually, we are discussing, we are in a, in a very regular discussions with, with, with government, state agencies, uh, invest, you know, uh, uh, intelligence agencies, to making sure that there is actually proper flow, uh, uh, a proper flow of information and also that the, in, the awareness is really getting to the right level. And we've talked about um, cooperation uh, and transparency. What else can banks do to control their costs? Well, I mean, there's many things, clearly, many things. And, and clearly, one of the things that you're using to reduce the cost is actually increasing, actually, the access to their service to, you know, to, uh, to, um, uh, to computers, I mean, to, uh, to, uh, to internet and all that. So that's a way. You see my country, I mean, in my home country, I'm living now here for four years, but in my home country, Belgium, you have literally no branch anymore, right? I mean, banks have been replacing branch by providing internet access to their services. That's what they do, right? And that's a way to reduce in costs as well. At the same time, it's actually also exposing uh, the, you know, the services to, to, uh, to, uh, to cyber attackers and this kind of stuff. So they need to work on, on, on two sides. So clearly, uh, bringing more services, automating more services is one of the ways of reduce, or reducing their costs. At the same time, as you all know, banks are very much under pressure of, from, from many other different aspects, which is come, when it comes to uh, regulations, compliance, making sure that what happened in 2006 or 2007 doesn't happen again. That is actually implying huge investment for the banks. I mean, uh, compu I mean computerization is another one. Cyber, cyber threat is another one. So clearly, I mean, the, the banking industry nowadays is very much under threat to being able to, to face all these investments they have to do to stay actually in the, in the business. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Aditya, looking at this from a cyber criminal's perspective for a moment, there have been a, a significant number of data breaches uh, that we found out about in recent years. Um, I think there's actually a glut of information on the market. This is actually a bad time to be a cyber criminal. <laughs> Well, uh, it, is getting, uh, it is getting worse and worse for cyber criminals. That's what I can say. Uh, because the researchers out there in the world, and there are many, and also companies you know, like Team 8 and many others in Israel and so on, they are actually, they understand to a great extent the problem. And they, are, uh, make, they have made significant efforts in productizing some of the technology that uh, has come out of research and actually putting them in the organizations. So I think cyber criminals, but at the same time, I must say that cyber criminals are getting smarter. Uh, they know what we are doing, and, and they are always finding ways to overcome. So it's a game that is being played, which I don't think will ever end, uh, because I don't think you can really make something 100% secure uh, unless you don't do that. So you have power, so you, and you want power, so you cannot avoid power. And you want to control power and transportation, et cetera, through industrial control systems. So you cannot avoid that. Cyber criminals will exist, but we can only make their uh, attempts unsuccessful to a certain extent. Chakri, can I bring you in on this question? I mean, connectivity is obviously central to Singapore's role in the world. Um, what, else, what else can and should Singapore do to strengthen its defenses? I think that uh, it, it is in the, in the hands of not just the government, but every private company out there. And I'd just like to make two points on that. One is that um, cost is going to be an important thing. Uh, very often there's a fallacy that when you talk about security, there is a, you know, a mysterious like uh, weighing scale and you have usability on the right and you have security on the left and one goes up and one goes down the other side. It's like <coughs> a seesaw of usability and security. But it's actually never been a seesaw. It's never been between two things. It's always been a triangle. So if you think of it as a triangle, it's about usability, it's about security, and it's about cost. And I think that a lot of the things that um, are being put in, in terms of ensuring that it's usable and secure, are, are raising the costs of doing business uh, quite considerably because cybersecurity is not cheap. And it's still not yet as cheap um, as it could be. Um, as cyber criminals become um, more sophisticated, we have to start thinking about their nexus with other things like um, artificial intelligence. Now, some of you may have heard of the DARPA grand challenge that took place a few weeks ago. And that was a, you know, the, the, all these servers on, on a stage, right? And then they were, they, they were competing to see which one was be the best uh, at automatically, um, in an automated securing of a system. And of course, with the automated security, uh, the Carnegie Mellon team, two Carnegie Mellon teams actually won. And uh, one was called Mayhem. Um, and uh, you think about it, but you can think about it from the other side, which is um, if you could do it for one side, you can do it for the other. The day will come where uh, the security challenge of an organization is a, a challenge of two sets of AI facing off against each other. <laughs> and then who will win? What will happen in that environment? I still do not know, but it's a brave new world. Interesting prospect. Um, you've heard a lot from us, uh, and there's a hand raised in the audience. We do have people with mics, I think. Uh, the gentleman just there. <coughs> there's nothing in the world that frightens me more than just where we're going. So, with sorry, can I ask you to say who you are, please? Oh, uh, Doug Mellinger from Clarion Capital in the United States. Um, so I've had my identity stolen. I can't file a tax return anymore without a special code. I've had more credit cards stolen than I can possibly count at this point. And, you know, when I think about what's going on in the world, the likelihood that any of us in this room are personally impacted by a terrorist or a terrorist incident, like what's happened in Belgium or France or anywhere else, is as close to zero as it comes. The likelihood that everybody in this room is attacked by something in the cyber world is as close to 100%. And I think that the conversation, a lot of what you guys have talked about, is all about defense. And I think we're having the wrong conversation. You know, from a terrorism standpoint, the cost to the world today from a cyber perspective, both the defensive costs and what is lost, is so enormous. It's, it's, I don't even have any idea how big it is, but I'm certain that it's far greater than what terrorism has impacted. Yet the amount of money that's being spent 
on fighting terrorists and very much from, from an offensive perspective dwarfs the amount that's being spent on cyber. And so I'd love your perspective on you know, this conversation of defense versus offense. Personally, I think we have to go massively on the offense you know, for both state actors and individuals. You know, I've tried to convince one of my congressmen to put in that it should become you know, punishable by death. I mean, literally to that point, because I'm so pissed at what's happened. But it just frightens me with this interconnectedness. I love your perspective. The dog, death penalties for hackers. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I, I do agree that um, there, the sentiment vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, cyber criminals must change. Uh, if we take the financial institutions example, uh, if somebody storms the bank downstairs with machine guns, they're they're going to be looked at as victims, uh, and everybody's going to know about it. And people are going to run after these criminals and try to put them in jail. Um, however, if the same attack takes place digitally from from in a far land, um, first of all, the risk that they're taking is much smaller. The returns are much bigger, and the bank is not going to be looked at as a victim, but as negligent. Um, and that sentiment must change. Um, I agree that there is no difference um, between a, a criminal activity that's done with uh, machine guns and a criminal activity that's done uh, from a faraway land uh, digitally. And, and I agree with that. The sentiment must change. Collaboration here is much more important internationally, obviously. Uh, attribution is very, very difficult in cybersecurity. Um, and honestly, right now, even if somebody does get caught, um, and spends a couple of years in, uh, uh, in jail, he's probably going to be hired for a lot of money by one of the cybersecurity companies after he gets out. And so the sentiment must change. By the way, the numbers are staggering. I think that the estimate is uh, that the loss in productivity um, that is uh, probably uh, can be attributed to cyber is anywhere between half a trillion to a trillion dollars yearly. Um, so the costs are um, staggering. Um, with regards to death penalty, a totally different uh, philosophical question, but I think that the, 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 we, we must change. Now, with regards to defense versus offense, I think that uh, we, we're used to looking at the world where, where there's defenders and there's offense uh, and they're totally uh, disconnected. What we're trying to promote, at least in my company, is proactive defense, um, which uh, understands where the attackers come from, and because we understand where the attackers come from, we try to be proactive in our defense um, as much as we can legally do that. Um, don't, so don't kill the bad guys, hire them, as we were saying. Uh, Jacqueline, can I bring you in on this? Um, do, you, do you think we're getting our priorities wrong when it comes to cybersecurity? And <coughs> uh, we should actually be spending much more money on agencies like yours. Well, I think active defense is actually an area that I think... Um, I think a lot of the community, cyber community is, is really beginning to explore um, it, you know, more, more in depth. Um, there are a lot of legal issues. Um, there are, uh, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, the, 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 the closest that you get to the hacker sometimes is, is the server that was the last hop before it hit you. And that's usually in some country uh, that, where the hacker is nowhere near. And, um, and, and he is probably somewhere where the law might not want to pursue him. So I would agree with Nadav on the, that the, the extent of international cooperation on this, company to company. Uh, Interpol has a center here. I think it's doing some very good work, none of which it can tell you, but I can tell you it's doing some very good work. Um, and uh, and this, kind of, this kind of thing needs to be more uh, advanced more supported by the, the community, and maybe it should be something that is um, exposed a bit more to a business audience, uh, the work of uh, organizations like Interpol in catching the bad guys. Thanks, Chuck. And we've got a few minutes in which we can take another question. Do we have another question from the audience? And if we don't, um, one thing we haven't touched on yet is the role of state actors. Um, and Dov, maybe if I could talk to you about that. What, what's um, one thing that I wondered about is whether open and democratic societies like the U.S. are actually more, more vulnerable to sort of state-led cybercrime than closed ones. What's your view of that? I mean, we saw the sort of you know, the Russian intervention in the uh, U.S. election this year. Yeah, well, of course, as, uh, the more advanced you are, the more interconnected you are, the more democratic you are. Uh, what you're basically raising um, is the attack surface. Um, the attack
attack surface is constantly growing. You get more devices, more code, more connections. That's rising exponentially. And so the attack surface is rising. That allows for more chances or opportunities for hackers around the world. So, yes, that is going to happen. The question, of course, is who is advancing faster, the attackers or the defenders? I think right now, honestly, the pace of change on the attack side and the agility on the attack side is much faster than that on the defense. And that's sort of the trajectory that we must change if we are to become more resilient to these cyber attacks. However, on the other hand, I do believe that because these nations are going to advance faster than the closed ones, eventually the trajectory is going to change and we're going to become much better defended. Again, as we understand where attackers come from, what their mindset is, we can also try to focus on their vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are on both sides. So, yes, right now we're in an asymmetric situation where it's much cheaper to attack than to defend. Attackers are better at understanding the vulnerabilities, but we can flip that. And once we do, we're going to get to an equilibrium where the cost-effect benefits of defense is going to rise dramatically. Aditya, can I bring you in on this? Is this something that Singapore should be concerned about, the role of states in cyber crime? I would say yes. Singapore so far, I think, has been fortunate, and I think that's because of its political system. Singapore is a very friendly country to everyone, and that, I think, makes a lot of difference. However, we cannot be just complacent about that, and I think Singapore is doing things. If you see the cybersecurity agency that has been set up, that is set up exactly to make sure that such kind of things do not happen. The state actors do not play a role here. But I must say that state actors generally, it is my feeling, I cannot prove it, is that state actors, when it comes to state actors, they act based on a lot of political issues. Because of certain political issues and turmoils, they decide to act in one way or the other. So, I mean, this is a very good question. That is the political system of a country and how the government of that country sort of acts, in some sense, has an impact on how the state actors will act. But it can often happen for unexpected reasons, can't it? I mean, there are so many hacks. No doubt. No doubt. And that's why we have places like CSA. Jacqueline, can I bring you in on the question of state role in cybercrime? Is this something that Singapore is thinking about guarding against? I don't think it's cybercrime that states are interested in. I don't think it's crime that they're interested in. I think they're interested in things that states have always been interested in, which is more about cyber war, cyber intelligence, and other state-related interests. I think many countries actually have units that both on the offense and defensive side of these arrangements. And this is blurring the lines between what we traditionally consider as the theaters of war in a conventional sense, you know, air, land, and sea, and what is really going to happen in future, which I think the Israeli government, for example, has been very advanced in looking at with the Cyber Command, the idea that there are four theaters of war, air, land, and sea, and cyber going forward. And the last one will be very, very difficult to, you know, spot, very difficult to figure out the blurring of lines between that and a peacetime situation. So I think that what has happened with state actors is that it's kind of changed the way that low-level, low-grade conflict actually will be carried out in the future. And I think every country needs to start being very aware of that. And how do you think open and democratic societies can best defend themselves? I mean, there has been some talk of cyber sovereignty, which is often used as a way of closing down web access. No, I think that's bad. I think that's something that's going to be very, very difficult, and it's not something that we would ever contemplate. The Internet is very important to us. We're a big node of data centers. We're a big hub of the Internet. In fact, the root servers of the Internet, I believe, are here. One of the very few, one of the few places in the world. 
Um, so this is something that we, we would not contemplate. Um, I don't think that it's a solution either. And so we need to find our way out uh, the same way that uh, every other country is going to have to grapple with this issue with a good mixture of defense uh, and some uh, good intelligence about offense. Even if I, if I may just add something to this, I think it's quite important. I think sometimes we tend to forget <coughs> that behind states, uh, democratic states, governments, all that, uh, you have people, people electing. <coughs> and somewhere, people will carry also the responsibility to taking care of all those things as well. I, I, I'm coming from a country that, as you know, Belgium actually has been under severe terrorist attacks over the last, uh, the last uh, couple of months. And there is one thing, since I'm actually going there very often, there is one thing that I, I can see now, and I, I, some way I tend to compare to behaviors of, of citizens in Singapore. People in Belgium now tend to become much more aware and cautious, and, and they, they tend not to report a lot more about uh, deviating behaviors, right? And, and, and somewhere they start now taking also their own responsibility vis-a-vis -vis of those attacks. Similarly, when it comes to cyber attacks, I think this is also, yes, states can do stuff, governments can do stuff, banks can do stuff and all that, but, but it's also the behaviors of each of us, right? I, I'm sure that here in this room, you are still many people that are using a single password for all the credit cards that you have, or that, you, or that haven't actually upgraded your firewalls on your PC for a while, and this kind of stuff. We've seen this in the banks as well. So I think it's, uh, the best defense is also about making us, all of us, gradually, I mean, responsible uh, to, um, to, for, for the defense, eventually also for, also for the offense. And, and it's, it's also a matter of, of information, awareness, people realizing actually what kind of threats uh, we are facing when it comes to terrorism, when it comes to cybercrime and this kind of stuff. Thank you, Alan. Uh, time for all of us to change our passwords now and to thank our speakers for a fantastic discussion. Thank you very much.